Whenever something is different from what you are used to, something happens in your mind, in your brain. It may be a change that society plays on you, your workplace plays on you. It may be a change that you yourself demanded for. For example, if you've been working with a boss that has always been lenient, now here comes a boss that knew no Pharaoh Abinicio. And everything is hard. Everything is strict. Something will happen in your brain. Fear will ensue. Anxiety will start. Confusion will start. For another example, if you were five in your team, they all of a sudden, due to COVID-19 pandemic impact on business, and there was a laying off of some staff, and from five member team to three member, and some extra responsibilities were headed to yours, your brain will respond, will react to that. Because it's a change. It's not something you're used to. If at home you grew up being able to ask your father or your mother a question, then you now get to a new workplace, they're not born you where to talk, to ask questions. Something will start happening in your brain. If as a leader, as a boss, as the MD or a director, you've always been having fantastic subordinates or team members. In fact, they take initiative, you don't have to micromanage them, then here comes this newly employed staff. You have to hand old. Something will happen in your brain. It cares not taking out of fear and anxiety, out of confusion, out of anger. You will react to such an employee. Employees need to feel psychologically safe for them to be able to give their best. A lot of organizations put priority on physical safety and no problem with that. But what is also equally important is psychological safety. A performance or the performance of a team is directly proportional to the level of their psychological safety. If their psychological safety goes down, their performance starts going down. And not just the performance, their engagement to that workplace, to that leader, to that work nature starts going down. Even in real life, if you don't feel safe in an environment, anxiety starts, fear sets in. Confusion setting. Now, the problem with that is that the more anxiety, the more the confusion, the more the stress chemicals that are pumping into your system. Whenever you are getting anxious, whenever you are getting scared, whenever you are getting even angry as a leader, you think that you are trying to get your employees to do their best. And any small thing, you are shouting at them. You are pumping stress chemicals into your system. There are about 30 stress hormones and about 1,400 stress-related chemicals, neurotransmitters. That's why you feel heavy when you're angry. That's why you feel heavy when you're scared, when you're confused. This is what is happening to your employee. Those chemicals are not designed to stay too long in your system. Please, I need you to say to your neighbor, stress chemicals, say stress chemicals, are not designed by God, to stay for too long in your system. If they stay for too long in your system, your physical health will suffer, your mental health will suffer, your performance will suffer, even your relationships will start suffering. Now, this is what, the, the bitter truth is that this is what a lot of Nigeria employees are dealing with. If it's okay to say the fact and the truth. And I have statistics to show this. So for example, a recent study that was done by Nigeria Earth Watch across Nigeria with focus on the major cities found that about 68% of Nigeria workers, 68% of Nigeria workers don't feel happy or emotionally connected to their job. And you cannot do without working. As a matter of fact, in Lagos, maybe not Abuja now, but in Lagos, if you go to the slide before, an average Nigerian worker spends two-thirds of their life in the workplace because you are sleeping for six to eight hours, remove that from 24 hours, you are left with about 16 to 18 hours. Out of the 16 to 18 hours, you most likely going to spend eight hours or thereabouts inside the workplace, then about three, four hours around the workplace, to and fro journey, if you are living in Lagos, maybe a little bit less if you are living in other cities. And that's why it is important that leaders in the workplace 
prioritize the psychological safety of their employees. But more importantly, as an employee, you must also prioritize your own psychological safety. Because the truth is this, whatever you cannot control, if you focus on it, you are setting yourself up for frustration. Some leaders may not change. And you don't have the remote control to their mind to change them. You just have to change yourself. Globally, it's not only unique to Nigeria. Work stress is at an all-time high. As a matter of fact, it's regarded as the number one workplace at problem now. And not just that, 86% of employees don't realize this, but they are operating between depression and burnout. And only about 63% of employees report that they are not capable enough. They don't have enough resources to manage the stress they are dealing with in the workplace. This is even a global one. You will see that about four in five of employees in Nigeria are at an increased risk of developing mental health issues. And about two-thirds of employees in Nigeria are at the risk of employee burnout. Let me tell you what a burnout means. Burnout means that things you were able to do normally, let's say you are able to stand and talk for 30 minutes, but now to talk for 15 minutes, you're getting tired easily. Let's say you're able to climb a staircase, a five-step staircase without panting, but now you climb a three-step staircase, you are panting heavily. Let's say you are able to think clearly on an option or a solution you want to generate, but now you struggle to solve a problem. Or you just can't seem to think clearly. It may be the fact that you are entering into burnout. And you will not get anything wrong if you go and do it. Lab test. It's essentially because there are too many stress chemicals running into your system for too long. The second part I want to share with you is this. There are factors that when they are absent in any workplace, there are major risk factors for sabotaging psychological safety and thus mental health issues. And when they are present, there are also factors when they are present, they are huge risk factors for sabotaging psychological safety or inducing mental health issues. Let me look at the factors that when they are absent in any organization in your workplace, just know that you are a candidate for mental health issue if you don't take charge or take responsibility for your psychological safety. I'm trying to balance it. It's the responsibility of the organization, but also it's the responsibility of the employee. And the truth is that if your organizational leaders are not willing to do something about it, it's your life. You've got to do something about it. If there is absence of psychological support and protection, that is policies. When an employee gives a feedback on a leader, a negative feedback that is true and genuine, is that employee protected? If that is not operational in your organization, just be careful because it means that your psychological safety is at risk, which means that you must start learning how to take charge of your psychological safety, of your own mental health. If your leaders, especially line managers, don't have psychological competencies. What we mean by psychological competencies, otherwise known by World Health Organization as mental health force aid. Mental health force aid is a group of skills, just like physical force aid, that we use in supporting and supporting mental health issues in the workplace. The advocacy is that all organizations must train, especially their managers, to be able to support and support mental health issues in the workplace before they escalate to become severe. And it's just like physical first aid. If somebody faints here, you should be able to, everybody should be able to know what to do to that person, not just a work of a medic. Everybody should be able to know the basic thing to do, the position to change the body of the person to that is unconscious, what to do with the tongue, what to do with the lips, what to do with the chest. Basic thing. The same way we have physical force aid, we have mental health force aid. And it's a training that organizations can sponsor their managers to go into mental health force aid. Also, if there's absence of clear paths for career growth and development, in case not taking, your mind is not used to that. Anxiety, fear, confusion, anger will start setting in in you. And if you don't tame it in time, because you are pumping stress chemicals into your system, it will manifest in your physical health. It will manifest in your mental health.
Every human being wants to be rewarded and recognized. When there is absence of that in any organization, especially when an employee is putting in his or her best, it's a matter of time something will start happening in the brain of such an employee. And it could be anger. But the problem is this. The more the anger tarries in your system, the more the stress chemicals are circulating in your system and damaging you. Other things that, when they are present, can sabotage psychological safety. Next slide. When there is presence of toxic leadership, some leaders are emotional baggages of their past. You may not even be able to change them. Talking to them may not even change them. I've had to consult for some organizations. I mean, a whole, I'm being careful now, but I won't mention them, but a whole boss that threw a sander at the employee, and this employee is not even a junior employee. She said that, ah, just out of anger. And I gather that is very temperamental. That's not the first time. Such a leader is toxic. He's dealing with trauma from the past. Because when you see somebody highly temperamental like that, regardless of who is involved, they don't really have control over it. They are traumatized. They are victims of trauma. And usually they can't help themselves until they seek help. But the truth is that with that leader seek help. So you as the subordinate or the employee, you must master how to safeguard your mental health working with that leader if you cannot leave that organization. And I will get to that on what to do. I have five tips for you on that. In fact, when reward and recognitions are present in an organization, but it's undervalued or compromised, they reward Mr. A because Mr. A is of a tribe or is a kin or related to the leader or to the CEO, but they don't reward Mr. B because he's the son of nobody or he's a guy, he's not a lady. All manners of emotions start brewing in the minds of such an employee and it's a matter of time. It will affect the work performance of the employee, but more importantly, the mental health of the employee. The third component of what I want to share with you today, I'm building a foundation for the last part I want to touch on. For those of you that are leaders in your organization, please, I'm begging you, this is an area you need to start looking into that will give you a feedback on how psychologically safe or unsafe your organization is. I won't dwell much on it. The slides are available to be shared with you. But these are audits, safety audits that you can do, psychological safety audits, or that you can get feedback from. When your employee or a worker exits from your organization, do you do a worker exit interview? which can give you a crucial, golden feedback on what is going wrong or what is going right with your organization. What about perception survey uh, by, your, by your employees? The employee engagement surveys. Time will not permit me to explain them. Then, there's what we call EAP reports, Employee Assistance Program, which is a global phenomenon now. Most Fortune 500 companies now are having Employee Assistance Program in their workplace, in which, just like HMO, Employees can reach out to a dedicated EAP line whenever they are in psychological distress for counseling, coaching, and therapy, ranging from mental health issues to work-related issues, work stress, conflict, and what have you. How do you safeguard your mind from stress, anxiety, and depression? Presence of abuse in the workplace. There are some leaders that they are notorious for bullying. There are some leaders that are notorious for verbal abuse. I mean, I've, they referred a company secretary to us recently that all of a sudden, a high flyer, all of a sudden, starts dwindling in performance. And it's just because the MD has verbally abused her repeatedly, she's losing confidence in herself. I had to do six sessions of coaching with her to restore back her confidence. So these are factors, but how do you, what are the tips that you can... Keep close to your heart to shield your mind from all manners of psychological risk factors, mental health risk factors, especially related to your work. And if you are already dealing with depression or dealing with anxiety, dealing with confidence crisis, or your work stress is high, now what do you do? I call them the ABCDE of shielding your mind from the pressure demands of the workplace, from those psychological safety risk factors. The ABCDE of recovering your mind if you are already dealing with depression. 
And like we saw, the, time, the tendency or probability is high. Let's say we have 500 here. I'm almost 100% sure that about 300 are dealing with a, one level of depression here, based on the prevailing statistics in Nigeria now. As a matter of fact, the problem is that most people don't even know they are dealing with depression. For example, if you are a man and you are recurrently visiting your doctor, this month malaria, next two weeks typhoid fever, next month physical pain, back pain, a same doctor that knows what he's doing will probe beyond physical to rule out psychological issues. Oftentimes, depression manifests as physical symptoms. If you are, as a mother, as a woman, you go to the kitchen with the intent of picking a knife, only for you to get to the middle of the kitchen, you are wondering what brought you to the kitchen. <laughs> Something is going on already in your psychological balance. And hopefully it won't become a full-blown depression or severe. Some of you, you have lost interest in a lot of things and you're saying that that's who I am. No, sir. No, man. That's not who you are. Something is going wrong. Something is going wrong. What do you do? The ABCD is starting with the A. You must learn to acknowledge your situation or assess it. The problem with problems is this. Mind my statement. The problem with problems is this. We run away from problem instead of facing it. We deny it. We develop what we call emotional numbness to co cope with it. You are dealing with financial crisis. But as the head of the house, and as an African man, men don't cry. Men don't talk about their issues. And you are dying silently. You are dying silently. You are running away from your problems, sir. And you may be a man of God, though. You may be a man of God, whether as a Muslim or as a Christian, but it doesn't matter. Men of God go through depression. I've worked with a couple of them including geos. You must learn to assess your situation. Don't shy away from it. You are in debt. Face it. Oh boy, I'm in debt. I need help. Awareness is the first step to any self-improvement. If you are ignoring it or denying it, the problem will grow bigger. Sometimes you may need to assess the workplace dynamics. If your workload is overbearing, it's not normal for one person to undo it. You just have to open the communication line with your management. They may be tough to undo. They may be tough in responding. But you just have to open the communication line. A closed mouth is a closed destiny. you got to talk. It's just that you must know the right and the appropriate channel to communicate. Sometimes what is causing your own problem is that that salary is too small for you. So either you face it and tell yourself this salary is too small. I need to cut down my expenses and dependencies on me, or I need to negotiate for a salary raise. Sometimes it's the way you live, especially if you are in Lagos. You are working in VI, and you are living at Mangoro, spending three, four hours to, then about two, three hours fro. That's about five, six hours in a day in traffic. There is no way you will not hedge fast, <laughs> except you have been able to manage your stress. So. Don't shy away from your problem. Learn to assess it. Sometimes it may be policy. Some policies out of, maybe unintentionally, management and leadership may put it in place and it's really killing the mental balance because we all have different personalities in the workplace. There are some personalities, they are able to cope with certain policies, but there are some personalities that will not cope well. I just finished consulting for an organization of about 4,000 plus staff, and we discovered that a particular unit they just created in 2020 are dominated majorly by the Generation Z. I mean, they are 24, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. And uh, based on the time they were born, which is a digital age, there is a shift in their brain, which science has proven. So they don't think the way we generation, the millennials and the generation Y, if you are above maybe 27, 28, 29 upward, they don't think the way we think. When they are too stifled, too structured, it stresses them. What you experience when you play the game 
those confusion and anxiety, he pushes them into he pushes them into that. And they wanted to get the best out of these guys. And unfortunately, in certain responsibilities, this generation, they are the best at it. Especially when it comes to digital media and co. They are the best at it. If you want to compete as a 50-year-old man with a 24-year-old guy, when it comes to digital media, you will kill yourself. You can't compete. You and I, we agree that if you have a 10-year-old, 8-year-old child at home, most likely he knows how to operate your phone more than you, even though you are the owner of the phone. So, we must be able to assess our situation and possibly influence a change in policy. One of the things they did in that organization that we submitted as our report and suggestion is to have flexibility of work operation for this particular department. And not just flexibility of work operation, even in their appearance. So now, they are allowed not to essentially wear suit and tie. And they are getting the best out of them. They are getting the best out of them. It's all about results. Assess your situation. Don't shy away from it. When you are able to assess your situation, the bees, you must be aware of your feelings. You must be aware of the feelings you are running on in that workplace as a result of those psychological safety risk factors. That boss that is bullying you, or that salary that is not enough, or the road traffic, or the workload on you, or even family-related issues. You must be aware of your feelings. Any feeling that is not named cannot be tamed. It's a psychological principle. I will repeat that. Any feeling, even when it's killing you, it's causing hypertension for you, it's pushing you into depression or anxiety disorder. Once you cannot name what you are dealing with, you cannot even tame it. And for you to name it, there are three things you must note. So under beware of your feelings, I won't be able to go deep into this, but I will refer you to materials that are available for you to uh, get and learn from. There are a few copies, but you can learn from them and get them. Three things you must be aware of when you are naming your feelings. Number one, you must realize that your feeling is a chemical. When you say you are feeling angry, it's because the biochemical of anger is circulating in your system. There is a name for it, but we are not in a medical program. When you are feeling fear, there is a chemical of fear that is circulating in your system. The volume or the concentration of that chemical will determine the intensity of the fear. When you are feeling worried, anxious, the chemical of anxiety is circulating in your system. When you feel happy, there are about chemicals for it. There are four major ones, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and dopamine. You feel happy. And there's a way you trigger them. So that's the first thing you must know. It's a biochemical circulating in your system when you are feeling somehow. When you are feeling demotivated, it's because some biochemicals are low in your system, especially dopamine. I'm saying this because we are going somewhere. But the problem with most of these biochemicals, especially the stress chemicals, is this. It's okay for them to be released into your system for a period. But when they are lasting for too long in your system, a lot of research has shown that they are critical risk factor. We just give examples, not to scare you, but just for you to gain awareness. For example, because your boss is nasty and very unfriendly towards you, you are holding on forgiveness against such a boss. Yes, we are not denying that that boss is terrible, but your unforgiveness is damaging you more than your boss. Because you are pumping stress chemicals into your system. Go and Google this. A 2017 report, after 19 years of study, linked unforgiveness and resentment in women to breast cancer. Google this. Google is our friend. And we can easily get information. What about anger as a leader? Because you are the MD. All the authorities start and end with you. Any small thing, you get angry anyhow. You shout at people. Yes, you are damaging the psychological or mental balance of your employee, but you are damaging yourself more. Even though you are, your reason may be valid, each time you shout out of anger, you are pumping stress chemicals into your system. And even after shouting, you are still angry for a couple of minutes or hours or days, the chemicals are damaging your system. As a matter of fact, anger is a strong risk factor for heart attack among men. But not just anger. When you express your anger, which is bad on its own, is a strong risk factor for heart attack in men, especially blacks, because of our muscular, muscular composition. But when you don't even express it, when you are repressing it, you just have it in your mind, we deal with that employee. 
Because he not do this thing. Because he not do this. He not give, give in to this. You are repressing anger. Emotions are energy emotion. That's where the word emotion came from. Energy emotion. And energy cannot be created nor destroyed. It can only be converted from one form to another. So, research has shown that repressed anger, when you repress an anger, it has three times the risk factor of an express anger for heart attack. So you know why you are damaging yourself? You're thinking you're damaging your employee. The way that feelings are about chemicals, they are not designed to stay for too long in your system if they are toxic feelings. After being aware of your feeling that you are running on, you must also be aware, the second part of it now, the action this feeling is pushing you into. Anger can push you to do certain things that you regret. Can push you into a certain attitude that you become addicted to. Yes, we can be addicted to attitude. Because they didn't give you salary raise. Because certain things didn't go your way. You decided to be misbehaving or doing things anyhow. Non-challenge attitude in the workplace. What you have failed to realize is this. Un uncle and auntie, you are programming your brain to become addicted to non-challenging. If after 10 years you have practiced nonchalant attitude and you go and start your own, you will struggle for the first two years without your business because you will approach that business with nonchalant attitude. You have programmed your brain. You have established neurological pathway in your brain that's become automatic by repeatedly practicing that. It will be difficult to break. It's like an addiction to alcohol or cocaine. Beware of your action. And the truth is that we're going to see in the C part of it, you can always choose your action regardless of what you're dealing with. But the top part of be aware of your feeling is the fact that you must also be aware of what is triggering your feeling. There's always a trigger for every feeling. Feelings don't just happen. And this is where I want to emphasize something. Feelings don't just happen. There's always a trigger for every feeling. Fears is trigger. That worry that you're dealing with as its trigger. Sadness that spiraled into depression as its trigger. But the problem with a lot of us is that we always think the trigger is the situation we are dealing with. That road traffic, if you are in Lagos, is not the trigger of your stress chemicals. That nagging wife or nagging husband or nasty boss or inadequate salary it's not the trigger. God didn't empower any situation to release or trigger the release of any biochemical into your system. What God gave the power to trigger the release of any biochemical into your system is your interpretation of the situation or your expectation from it. And that's your trigger. Your trigger for any feeling is your interpretation of a situation, your expectation from it. Three people can be dealing with the same issue and they will experience different feelings. That's the same reason why your colleague will say an insulting statement to you, you get angry, you feel the anger. But if a two-year-old child, cute child, says the same statement, you start laughing. The same situation but different interpretation does different feeling. You must start learning about how to identify your trigger so you can deal with it. And remember what I said? The trigger of any feeling is your interpretation of that situation or your expectation from it. We're going to see that on that dean. Because it's essentially about your thoughts. You can always reframe it. If it's pumping wrong chemicals into your system, then go and attack your trigger. While you are working towards changing that situation. But you can't wait till the situation changes. A lot may be damaging you. You've got to change your perception of that situation while you are working towards changing that situation. And changing your perception slows down the stress chemicals in your system, allows your brain to be able to boot well so that you can even creatively generate options. The C is choosing your action despite your feeling. Like I said, you can always choose your action despite your feeling. I remember sharing this at a conference in Ghana, and a Ghanaian asked this question. That Dr. Osas, I agree with you, but all those things are science on paper. <laughs> And I allowed him to finish, and I asked. So, give me an example of impossibility of choosing your action despite your feeling. He gave an example. And I gave another scenario that is similar to that example, and he laughed. 
Say, Dr. Sash, you are correct. The truth is this. Let me give you an, ex an example. If your wife says a statement that gets you angry, that perhaps you have slapped her, which we are not condoning that, you have slapped her before, and you are excusing it that it's what she said that got me angry. To a layman, you are right. But to those of us that understand the way the human brain and mind works, we know that you are just giving an excuse. You are wrong. It's not what she said that got you angry. You chose to hurt in anger. So, if a mobile policeman or a mobile policewoman, AK-47 carrying mobile policewoman, says the same statement to you that your wife said that landed her a slap, you will be angry at that mobile policewoman, but that anger will stay inside. You will choose your action. You can always choose your action despite your feeling. You can always choose your action despite your feeling. There are steps to take in choosing your action. We call them the five A's. Embracing help and support. And I want to focus more on the men here. In Africa, men don't like seeking help. The only thing they like talking about is football. Where is the money? And women. And that's the bitter truth. I'm a man also. When they are dying inside, even their wife, they don't open up. Because society has programmed us to believe that opening up on your issue is a sign of weakness. Unfortunately, that's a fallacy from the pit of hell. The fact that you are able to open up to someone that is confidential, that is a compassionate, that is, you regard as a compliment to you, is a sign of strength. If you are bottling it up, it's a sign of weakness. And that's what is killing a lot of men. All manners of hypertension. You don't want to hear about the statistics of hypertension in Nigeria presently. I don't want to focus on it. I don't want to reel out too much of statistics. And it's not just about your diet. Your diet matters. Your weight matters. But it's also about the stress chemicals in the name of emotions you are running on for too long. Embrace help. And for ladies also, please embrace help. In your organization, if you have the employee assistance program, use it. We handle EAP for about 49 companies, and we know organizations that this year alone, we are in the fifth month, no staff has reached out, and they've paid for it. The organization has paid for it because it's free to the employee. We know organizations, out of the 49 we're handling, we know organizations that no staff has reached out, despite all the communication material sent, and we know organizations that are really using it. And there's no EAP on your organization. Seek help. Maybe start by talking to a colleague that you can trust, or a manager you can trust, or check for a coach or a therapist or counselor around you. Sometimes you cannot deal with your issue alone. Man is not created to be an island. We all need shoulders to lean on. And it's not a sign of weakness. Sometimes just 30 minutes of talking to someone will open your eyes to the blind spot you have. And we all have blind spots. Sometimes it's your imaginations that are playing pranks on you. Your imaginations are running helter scatter. Just by talking to someone will help you shape it back. You must embrace it. And if it's becoming severe, that is, it's affecting your functionality, then you need to seek professional help. Maybe a psychotherapist or a psychiatrist. Sometimes it's medications that you just need to restore back the balance. And be careful of listening to religious fallacies. That is demon that is causing depression. We are not saying there are no demons, but 95% of cases have nothing to do with demons. I remember on Sharing Live issue in 2018, I was anchoring sharing live issue from 2017 to 2019 on Expression FM Lagos. And somebody called in that, please, I need help for my younger sister, her last born, a 21 years old. They couldn't reach her for more than four months, only for their parents to open up that they've taken her to a deliverance home. For more than four months, they can't find their sister. The parents have taken her to a deliverance home. This girl was depressed, and because the parents didn't even understand depression, from depression she started manifesting what we call psychosis. She started hearing voices that others are not hearing. She started seeing things that others are not seeing, and getting restless. She said they took her to a deliverance home. So when she called in, I said, okay, give me the contact of your parents. And I spoke with them after the show. I spoke with them. And they were hell bent on, in fact, I remember what the father said. The father said, you doctors, you are trying to, and he said in Yoruba, in Katemo, look what you, let me translate it to English. Wait, uh, what you don't know is more than what you know. <laughs> and I said, I agree, sir. 
fact, wisdom comes with gray hair because it's an elderly man. But, sir, sometimes we need to be able to combine the knowledge of the elders and the young so that we can achieve solutions. When there was no headway, we got policemen involved. So they forcefully took the parents to lead us to the deliverance home. And when we got there to the prophet, the, one prophet like that, somewhere on the mainland in Lagos, when we got to the room where the girl was kept, at 21 years old, tied. They tied her legs, tied her hands. Then the worst part of it was that there were incisions on her body in the name of exorcising demons. For more than four months, no improvement. Then we took the girl out, called my friend that was the MD of a mental health facility in Lagos, and they quickly arranged, and she was taken there. Then I was following up over the phone. It took me five weeks before I could create time to visit. And I remember I went there, and I saw that the countenance of the lady has improved because they commenced our medications. And uh, she was able to eat, she was able to relate, she was able to recognize the parents. She stopped hearing voices that others were not hearing. I spent like about 30 minutes with them and I was leaving for the car park. The father, the elderly man, walked me to the car park. So at the car park, I decided to be mischievous. So I said, Daddy, remember what you said to me then? That in Katamo, Lokpo Jun Katamo, just to justify that this is caused by demons. So I said, Sir, so if they are caused by demons, does it mean that the demons responded to the medications? that we gave her. So at the intake of the medication, the demons ran out. So the man laughed. He said, <laughs> The meaning of Aigbotan is that we know they exhaust wisdom. Ladies and gentlemen, please embrace that. God is the author of science. Some mood issues you are dealing with are just about chemical imbalance in your brain. Medication will help you restore your balance. But don't wait till you even need medication because all medications are chemicals. They have side effects. Don't wait till it becomes severe that you need medication. Seek help, therapy, counseling, and coaching. That's about every cell. So let me go to the last one, the D, discipline your thoughts. And that's the one we use an exercise to do. Ladies and gentlemen, this is resting on a principle. The way you see a situation is not essentially the reality of the situation. How we see a situation is more about how we have been programmed to see it. Three people can be seeing a situation and they will see it differently. So sometimes... What you are calling small, the salary you are calling small is because you have been programmed to perceive it as small. And therefore, you are not exploring or maximizing the opportunities in that small salary. There was a time in your life you were earning 40,000 error. And you are happier than now that you are earning 100,000 error. You know why? Parkinson's rule. Expenses will always rise to meet the rising income. So when you were under 40,000 error salary, you are okay with 500 error shares. But now they raise it to 100,000 era. You now started wearing yours and cutties. 7,000, 12 fake one, then the original one, 16K, 18K. Your perception, which is your trigger of your feeling, determines what you feel. And if your feeling is damaging you, you can reframe how you are seeing that situation. Because the real problem in life is not the problem we are dealing with. The real problem in life is how we see the problem. So, you will tell me what you see. Go on. Go on. So, tell me what you can see on the screen, ladies and gentlemen. Please, chorus answer. What can you see? What image is that? Flower verse. Somebody mentioned flower verse. I heard somebody mention two faces facing each other. What else can you see? Chorus answers, please, fast. Can't do stand. Bear, stool, who works with MCMB here? Pillar, <laughs> flower vase, what else? If you are working in a medical lab, you easily see a lancet blade. But if you don't work in a medical lab, even though you are looking at it, like hold your eyes like this to look at it, you will not see it. If you don't play chess, you will not see a chess piece there. But you play chess, you easily see a chess piece there. If you grew up in a royal home, you easily see a goblet. But if you didn't grow up in a royal home, you will not see a goblet. What you are seeing is not what is on the screen. What you are seeing is what your brain has been programmed to make a meaning of this pattern. That's why, next slide, we say in psychology and neuroscience, we don't see events as it is. We see an event or situation as we are. Sometimes you need to tap yourself 
back to reality, out of your imaginations, because you may be interpreting wrongly. You are interpreting the end of the road, but it might just be a bend. There are some issues you were worried sick about 10 years ago. If you count 10 of those worries or 10 of those things that you were worried sick about 10, 20, 30 years ago, like maybe you were worried sick about if you gain admission, if you ever get married, if you ever have a child, if you ever get a job. But now you look back at a lot of those worries. If you count them and there are 10, 8 of those 10 worries didn't eventually materialize. Because your imaginations were playing pranks on you and you didn't know how to reframe or master them. What can you see? What can you see? Is it moving or fixed? It's moving, right? The bitter truth is that it's a picture. A picture, no, they move. Except Otumoko, they there. It's not a video, it's a picture. But you know what happened? The painter created an illusion. So, he understands that you and I have seen a pin or a stone drops inside water to create a ripple effect when the ripple spread out. So he, he painted using colors to represent the pattern of water spreading out. So, but because you and I are seeing water spreading out that way, even though you are looking at it as a picture, your brain is telling you it's moving like water ripples. That's why I say to people, don't overtrust your mind. Your mind can be influenced by your programming. If you grew up with your father and it was at a particular age that your father lost his job and things went bad, if care is not taken 25, 30 years after, at the mention of retrenchment or downsizing, you will enter into anxiety. Not because they've even retrenched or downsized, but because you have been programmed to fear downsizing because of what you experienced during your father's time. Let's read this together. One, two, go. I will not take rhythm. <laughs> okay, so what happened is this. The letters are scrambled, but you are still able to read it. The reason is there, the last sentence. This is because your mind does not read every letter by itself. But the word has a whole. Let me explain it to you. When you were growing up, maybe not sure in primary school, you were taught how to pronounce according. A-C-C-O-R-D-I-N-G. And you have repeatedly read according. All those letters in the past. Your brain has established pathways for it. Such that now... It doesn't matter how they arrange the in-between words, or letters rather. Once the first and the last letters are intact, your brain gives you what is in your head, not what is on the screen. The same thing with situations in life. If a statement has been used by your mom or a nasty boss in the past repeatedly at you, that meant insult. If another person shares the same statement with you that didn't mean it as insult, you will interpret it as insult. So you need to caution yourself and stop running yourself on stress chemicals damaging you. Be safe. Last slide, please. Skip, skip this. So let's read this together also from top to bottom. One, two, go. Confuse me that there is something good in every day. Because when you take a closer look, this world is a pretty evil place. Even if some goodness does shine through once in a while, satisfaction and happiness don't last. And it's not true that it's all in the mind and heart, because true happiness can be obtained only if one's surroundings are good. It's not true that good exists. I'm sure you can agree with me. The reality creates my attitude. It's all beyond my control. And you never in a million years hear me say that today was a good day. If your friend is saying this to you, what will you think of your friend? Depressed, sad, unhappy, pessimistic, right? The same letter, read it from, oh, please, presentation mode. The same letter, let's read it from bottom to the top. One, two, go. Today was a good day. And you never in a million years hear me say that. It's all beyond my control. My attitude creates the reality. I'm sure you can agree. It's not true that good exists. Only if one's surroundings are good. 
true happiness can be obtained because it's all in the mind and heart. And it's not true that satisfaction and happiness don't last. Some goodness does shine through once in a while. Even if this world is a pretty evil place. Because when you take a closer look, there is something good in every day. And don't try to convince me that today was the absolute worst day ever. If your friend is saying this to you, what will you think of your friend? Happiness, optimistic, right? What changed? The same letter, but it changed in the direction. Sometimes it's the direction that you are mentally facing that determines what you are feeling. If you believe mentally that there's no path for you to rise in this organization, you will easily interpret even good gesture as bad. If you mentally believe Nigeria is a write-off, even when you see an opportunity, you will interpret it as a problem. That's the way the human mind works. Perception is stronger than reality. If you have a nightmare, God forbid, that a masquerade is chasing you with a cutlass, and you are running for your dear life, panting heavily in that nightmare, in that dream, sweating profusely. If your spouse suddenly taps you and you wake up, you will be panting heavily in real life. And you'll be sweating profusely in real life because perception is stronger than reality. Your mind responds to perception the same way as reality. And that's why you must always know that the way you see something is more important than what you are seeing. The first thing you must realize about anger is this. It's normal. It's natural. Even the scripture attests to that. I mean, if you are a Christian, Ephesians 4.26, be angry, but just don't let two things happen when you are hungry. Don't let the sun set on it. That is, talking about duration. And don't let the devil have a foothold on you as a result of that. Talking about the action. And that's why I've said before, you must realize that anger is natural, it's normal. However, certain background and genetical predisposition can program you to be excessively hungry or impossibly angry. For example, there's a condition called temperamental disorder. The people that there's an issue in their, in their is an, area, an area in the brain that regulates anger. But the regulation of that area in the brain is not balanced and it has a link to genetics. And that's why you, if a father or a mother is temperamental and has five kids, ch chance is there that one of them may have that. All right? But there is still help. Every anger can be managed. First thing, realize it's natural, it's normal. The problem is not the anger you are feeling. In fact, when you realize that the feeling of the anger is not the problem, you have delivered yourself to a large extent. The feeling is not the problem. It is the duration and the action. When you are getting angry for too long, there is no way to you know, hijack your action. A lot of times when you express anger, it didn't just start at the point of getting, expressing it. It's already brewing. You just didn't realize it. Okay? Another thing I will say is this. You must realize that you must not fight your feeling. Time didn't permit me to talk about this. In psychology, we don't resist feeling. If you try to stop your worry, you will worry more. If you try to stop anger, you will get angry the more. If you try to stop fear or sadness, you will feel sad or fearful the more. You don't stop feelings. You convert them. You don't stop feeling, you convert them. Because they are energy. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed. They can only be converted. And how do you convert them? Based on what I said earlier on, there's, every, there's a trigger for every feeling. And every feeling can push you into certain action and inaction. Master how to choose your action despite the feeling of your anger. There's a way to choose your action. There are five ways to it. One of it, one of the A's is accept yourself regardless. When somebody says something that you interpret as insulting, if you get angry and express the anger at that person, it's because you don't accept yourself regardless. Someone that accepts himself regardless of whatever anybody says to him or her will not feel insulted. When you get angry, what it means is that you regard the statement of that person over the words you are saying to yourself. It means that you honor the words of that person over your own words that you are saying to yourself. So when you learn to master how to accept yourself regardless, which is one of the five A's, you are building your capacity to choose your action despite your feeling. Time will not permit me to go to the, into the four A's, but you can get more of it in the material. Then you must also learn to identify your trigger. Yeah, we all have different triggers for anger. What triggers my guy here may not trigger me into anger. 
So identify your trigger and there are things you can do with trigger. I've shown you one of it. Remember what triggers are? The way you are interpreting a situation and what you are expecting from it. Sometimes you just learn to challenge or question your interpretation. Just master it. It comes with practice though. Question, why am I interpreting the way this man is looking at me as a, a disregard? What if he's not a disregard? What if he has an eye problem? And you know, we, we, we do that a lot. She passed in front of your office and she didn't say, hello, sir. What an insubordination. And you are getting angry, silently. And any opportunity that comes up that the lady misbehaves or drops the ball, you fire at her. You are doing it yourself. That's why I always jokingly say that if you think because you are shouting or verbally lashing out out of anger at an employee, at a lady, and you think you are doing the person, he will do she, do he. If a wife says, I will not forgive my husband out of anger, she will do he, do she. I hope you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> so you must learn to challenge your trigger, your interpretation and expectation. Another thing you need to do, sometimes you need to avoid your trigger. The, the, your object of trigger, rather, the situation. You may not have the capacity to question that thought, or you have been questioning it, and you are reaching your elastic limit. Avoid it. Ladies and gentlemen, there is nobody that is indispensable. Sometimes some friendship needs to be cut off. Sometimes some environment needs to be distanced from. And in fact, and I'm being careful to say this, there is no organization that can determine your destiny forever. I've worked with, I once worked with the head of commercial for a bank. I mean, the lady that the boss threw Sanda at. When we track everything that this man has been saying to her in the name of bringing target, bringing target, and this woman is thinking, in fact, she's already confirmed diagnosed of generalized anxiety disorder, and she's sinking into depression. So I gave her two options. Are you willing to commence medication and commence psychotherapy for the next 12 weeks? Or else you will sink for that. Or let's first cut off the object of your trigger. Are you, can you resign? The fear of the unknown makes us cling to what is hurting us. But what we don't realize is this. Until you cross the fence to the other side of life, you will not know or you never realize if there is another beautiful side of life. It may take a few weeks. It may take cutting down your expenses. I mean, I left clinical world. I left the Nigeria Air Force in 2011. It was a tough call for me. I went into psychology and neuroscience, exhausted my savings on all manners of courses, came back, tried to set up my consulting. For seven months, no single client. Things were tough. But gradually, we started picking up. The truth is that once there's a will, there is a way. As a matter of fact, the universe rearranges itself for who does not know how to give up. Don't remain stuck at where you are being hurt. Including marriage, you need to, sometimes it requires temporary separation. We are seeing too much of domestic violence. Just three weeks ago, we lost another woman. Just three weeks ago. This aside, the one that was popular, that trended. And that one pained me so much because last year I got to know about it. Her friends reached out to me sent her picture because she has lost partial, she, has, she had partial vision, lost left eye as a result of beating. And she's just temporarily, we are not asking you to divorce, just temporarily separate. You cannot heal in the environment where you are being hurt. It's impossible. You've got to come out of that environment first. Choosing your action despite your feeling. Eating. Your mood can influence your mood. Your food rather can influence your mood. What you eat can control your mood. What you eat can control your mood. For example, so a lot of us, when we are too stressed, what we are always looking for is heavy carbohydrates. In fact, I know some men, because they have worked tirelessly, they have exhausted themselves from 6 a.m. in the morning to about 8 p.m. working. When they get home, four mama, five a body, six shaki. You are damaging your emotional health the more. Because you are pumping unnecessary cholesterol into your system. If there's a physical health issue, your mental health will also suffer in a matter of time. Then, when you are eating heavy carbohydrates, it does not help 
your mood regulation, there's a chemical called serotonin, which is the major chemical in most antidepressants, drugs for depression. There are foods that help to support the release of serotonin into your system. We call it the mental realization hormone. It helps to calm you down. For example, they are majorly proteins. Then they are found in some nuts, like almond nuts. Then found largely, together with omega-3, in some fish, not all fish. But I know some men that will tell you, what do they do with fish? Give me pomo, give me shaki. I'm not saying they are bad. But try to master what you eat because your diet can control your mood. Your food can control your mood. There are other things, physical exercise. But they are all under choosing your action. You are feeling low in spirit. And your mind is telling you, you cannot go and exercise. Let me tell you the trick. It's the exercise that will deliver you from that low mood. But it's that same exercise that your mind is telling you to not do. If you can force yourself, that's why not feeling it not feeling like it, to go and exercise. Even if it's just 10 minutes of stretches. I'm not saying you should go and jog or carry weights. Just stretches, pilates, yoga stretches. Even in your room, you will release endorphins into your system, otherwise known as feel-good hormone. And gradually doing that, you will discover that your spirit will rise. You wake up, you don't feel like talking to anybody. Please don't cut off from people, especially good people. Connect with people. That's part of choosing your action. That's part of your feeling. Some people, when they are feeling low, feeling sad, they don't want to pick up. They don't want to connect with anybody. They, even their parents, their family member, their colleagues. You are denying yourself a chemical of happiness called oxytocin that makes you feel valued, feel love. It's called the love of bonding hormone. These are examples of things you can do. Thank you.